Um, look, what you've got on the screen there, uh, I, th I think is a, is a pretty good start to, to what is going on in the world at the moment. Uh, Bible prophecy tells the end of the story, because the amazing thing is that Bible prophecy does. It tells us exactly what is going on in the world and where it is all leading. And what it does for me, it reinforces my confidence and my interest in the Bible. And I hope it does with you as well. <clears throat> what you might notice at the top of the screen there, it says, United Nations Chief, uh, that's Guterres, warns a wind of madness is sweeping the globe. Well, we look around, and if you, if you know what's going on in America, in Britain, Europe, and elsewhere, Hong Kong, and goodness knows where else, yes, a wind of madness is destroying the world as we know it. And naturally, we wonder what it is going to bring for the future. What you will also notice as you come down here, Jeremiah chapter 51 verse 7 says, the nations are mad. Now, true, that's talking about Babylon in ancient times, but it is also a prophecy of the modern Babylon, which you also, as you know, meet in particularly in the book of Revelation. And there, the similar words are spoken about Babylon of old as the modern Babylon, which is Rome, and the Catholic system which stems from Rome. And uh, yes, there is madness sweeping Europe and the other countries. What does it all portend? Well, the Bible prophecy foretells the end of the story. And it's so interesting. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And uh, once we know the prophets, of course, yes, we see it. Now, let me give you some uh, idea of what uh, we, we find in prophecy. Uh, it says here, the Bible prophecy describes extremely unusual circumstances existing at Christ's return. Okay, what have we got? Number one, the rebirth of Israel after not existing for 1900 years. This is a very plain fulfillment of a whole raft of prophecies in the Old and the New Testament. I'm told there are something like 400 passages which speak of the return of Israel. I've never actually counted them myself. But what we do know is in Isaiah 43, it says, God says to Israel that Israel is his witness. And the history of Israel is the greatest witness, actually, of the existence of God and that God is working amongst the nations. What about Jerusalem? Jerusalem was taken by the Jews in the Six Day War of 1967. And uh, going there to Luke 21 verse 24 and Zechariah 12 verse 1, Jerusalem, after centuries of Gentile domination, will be again under Jewish control. And so it is. And also it's at a time of world strife, and so it is. What, what uh, we might appreciate here, of course, is that Israel is the only country in history that has ever reoccupied its ancient land again. Not only after so long, but the only one that has done that, I understand. Secondly, They've occupied Jerusalem and made it their capital city, which it had been for a over a thousand years, about a thousand years in, uh, in history. And not only that, but the Hebrew language was a dead language. And it's the only language in the whole of history that has been dead and is alive again and spoken. And when I was in the Museum of the Scrolls, this is in... Uh, in Jerusalem, I, I happened to pass a group of Americans and the guide was talking to them while we were looking at some of the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, the one American said to the guide, but can you read it? And he said, of course I can, he said. It's the same way that my wife speaks to me. You couldn't even do that with English, especially here. We'll never mind that. Um, so, democracy. 
in uh, number three, democracy to be the people's expectation. This comes out of the French Revolution. Liberty, equality and fraternity to dominate political thinking. We have, of course, in, in Revelation, the last book of the Bible, chapter 11, a description of the French Revolution in its timing, as it lays it out. And uh, also in Revelation 16, it mentions the, uh, the, the spirit that came out of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity. If you're looking at it, of course, you'll know it as the frog spirit. The frog identifies with France, but the spirit that comes out is liberty, equality, fraternity, and the, the French Revolution has changed the modern world. And then number four, Christianity is to turn against Christ. Now this hasn't happened yet, but you can see it coming. Christianity to turn against Christ at his return. You get that in Psalm 2. But also you realize that Christianity today is widely astray to, from the teachings of the Bible and the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can see that coming. Number five, European nations to unify and willingly give up their sovereign power to be ruled by a central government. Well, it's staggering along as the European Union, uh, but Revelation chapter 17 speaks in this way, and uh, eventually it will occur, actually under Russian influence. We'll look at that later. Number six, homosexuality is to become a celebrated lifestyle. Luke 17 there, uh, it has. Uh, number seven, Russia, Germany and France, known in Ezekiel chapter 38 in the Old Testament as Ross, the ancient name of Russia, Ross. Uh, Magog, which was Central Europe. Uh, Central Europe today is largely Germany, though no, it's not in just Germany alone. And Goma, which France, France uh, across France and Spain, that is Western Europe. And these will become allied together, as Ezekiel 38, verse 6 tells us, at the time of the end, ready to invade the land of Israel. And what we want to see is, is the terrible anti-Semitism uh, that is building up, which will encourage them to move with Russia on an invasion into Israel and then down to Egypt. So number eight, hostile Arab nations to ally with Israel. That doesn't mean all Arab nations. There is tremendous hatred amongst Arab nations of the people of Israel. But certain Arab nations are swinging round behind Israel. And Ezekiel 38 mentions Sheba and Dedan in verse 13. And Sheba and Dedan relate to Saudi Arabia and the western Persian Gulf countries. And this is exactly what is happening. We see it all coming now. Uh, number nine, believers to challenge creation. That's certainly so. Evolution has sort of swept the world. Uh, we'll see later on that there's very little evidence for it. In fact, I don't think there's any real evidence at all. And I've spent 40 years studying um, evolution just to check it. So, um, yes, believers are challenging creation. That's mentioned in the second of Peter 3, verse 46, and it relates to Israel, sorry, to Christians and to certain others as well. Now, number 10, a surge in travel and a vast increase in knowledge from Daniel 12, verse 4. Well, the surge in travel has um, collapsed at the moment with the COVID, but it will come back again, we are sure. I'm right, pressing the wrong button. That's better, that's better. Um, now there's a bit of a, a, a mixture on this one. Um, on the right hand side at the top you've got Daniel chapter 2. You are generally familiar with Daniel chapter 2. And that is of the four major world empires which have appeared throughout history. The legs of iron of the image speak of the iron rule of Rome. And when it comes down to the feet, you remember, it's a combination of iron and clay. 
And uh, we have understood, of course, that not only does the iron speak of the remnants of the old Roman Empire in Europe, but the clay itself is Russia, and it's the Russian move into Europe. And Russia, as we've said before, is actually mentioned under its ancient name of Rosh in Ezekiel chapter 38. Obviously, the Bible uses the ancient names so that the readers in early times could identify the territories that are spoken of. There has been some adjustment to the names over history, but we still know where they are and what our countries are being spoken about. So, when we come up here, we've got uh, the Gomeric tribes. This is from Germany, Central Europe, and so on. Uh, and also Goma. These are all mentioned in Ezekiel 38, France. You've got Rosh, Tubal, and Meshech, parts of Russia, Rosh. And Togama, which is the southern portion of Russia, Georgia and Circassia and so on. These with Libya and Ethiopia, sound of Egypt, uh, south of Egypt, will invade Israel. Libya now, of course, does have Russian uh, troops in there. Uh, the Russian aircraft have been moved in and Russia is promoting this uh, revolution in, in Libya with the hope that they will gain there not only the vast oil reserves in Libya, but also the best deep water ports in the Mediterranean area. And it's the deep water ports which are so important for them. Um, now, the, this invasion, which is mentioned there on the top left-hand side, is the Battle of Armageddon, which you see here. The Hebrew word Armageddon indicates that when the time of the end comes, Hebrew is spoken. And it said it's a name which is associated with the Holy Land. So it's got to mean the Jews are back in the land speaking Hebrew. Armor is made up of three Hebrew ideas. Armor, which means a heap of sheaves, so it's a time of harvest of the nations, you might say. Gai is a valley. Gehenna is uh, derived from that, and that's a valley outside the walls of Jerusalem. And Don, or Dan, that's the word for judgment. So this Armageddon that is coming actually means a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. And Russia and Europe, plainly in Ezekiel 38, and in Daniel chapter 11, are involved in this. I say Daniel chapter 11, because here in Daniel chapter 11, we have a king of the north and a king of the south. Why does it say latter day? Because history through da throughout Daniel chapter 11, this Old Testament prophet, does speak of a king of the north and a king of the south and the wars between them, uh, north of Israel and south of Israel in Egypt. And the wars between them meant they trampled upon Israel as they went north and south and devastated Israel each time. And this is coming again. So uh, what's it looking like? From, from the south, I might mention, uh, is Britain and the Commonwealth countries and uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, one or two others. Where's America in this? We'll talk about that in a few moments. But here is uh, the British bases in, in that region. Um, this one here is on the island of Diego Garcia, which is a, a British-occupied island with a very major base there, which now America is also sharing. So Britain had left the Persian Gulf area, but you see today that she has bases around that region. And we understand from prophecy that at the time of the end, Britain actually will come via the Persian Gulf, as well as along the Mediterranean, to the area of Israel for the final battle, Armageddon, the focal point of which will be at Jerusalem. So uh, Ezekiel 38 mentions Sheba and Dedan, and uh, that's Saudi Arabia. The merchants of Tarshish, Tersh Tarshish was the ancient name for Britain in Bible times. It, it's, it's not a guesswork of where Tarshish is. It was actually the name for Britain in Bible times. 
uh, and the young lions are the Commonwealth nations associated with um, Britain who will be involved in this. Now here are American bases, well there are quite a few more there aren't there? And you'll notice they've also occupied partly the uh, British base at Diego Garcia, uh, Garcia because it's in such a, an important position uh, just south of the Persian Sea and the Red Sea and the, the traffic that is coming through the Indian Ocean to those seas and to the um, Suez Canal. So we'll move on from there. Britain out of the European Union. Why? What, what was so important about it? I think it's one of the major indications that with the time of the end we're seeing at the moment. Um, the evidence here is see, as you see at the top, God could never accomplish the spiritual good he intends for Tarshish, for Britain, had Britain remained in the European Union. That's true, because there is an entirely different role for Britain that is contending with Russia and Europe in their grab, land grab in the Middle East. Britain and the Commonwealth and so on is involved in opposing that move. So how could she be a part of Europe? Secondly, Britain is on a different prophetic tra trajectory than Europe, which I'm just indicating very briefly. This is all in Ezekiel chapter 38. And then it says, prior to Christ's return, Britain is aligned with the young lions and Sheba and Dedan. This is all in uh, Ezekiel 38 from verse 13. Uh, Europe is aligned with Russia and Iran. And uh, that's being promoted by both Germany and now very strongly by France that then must get closer and more allied with Russia and Iran. Now uh, then we pass on to at Christ's return. Britain and Europe are on opposite sides, you see. As we mentioned, the kings of the north and the kings of the south. But Britain isn't south of Israel, but its bases are, and Britain will come from the south, whereas Russia and Europe will have come into the land from the north. And then, after Christ's return, both Britain and Europe are to be humbled. But their response to the humbling by the, the advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, Israel's Messiah, will be in two different ways. As it says there, Britain will submit to Christ and cooperate with him. We have that in the scriptures. Um, Britain will submit to Christ, cooperate with him. The, the Bible in previous times has prepared Britain in some ways for that because the British people for, for uh, three or four hundred years have looked for the restoration of the Jews to the land because it will herald the return of Christ. Uh, that is still there in the background. And then Europe, it says, Europe, one, will reject Christ's rule. So it is because it's Catholic. Uh, two, they will reject the everlasting gospel. That is, from a revelation, um, that a revelation uh, there, that when Christ has come, ambassadors will go out to the nations of the world to call upon them to submit to the rule of Jesus Christ from Jerusalem. And of course, many will not. Thirdly, Europe will reject that the Jews are God's people. They're doing that all the time. And Revelation tells us in chapter 17, they will make war against the Lamb, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. They will try to prevent the kingdom's establishment in the land of Israel. Because it's totally against their teaching. Their teaching is that Israel are finished in God's purpose, but the Bible doesn't say that, and that the church has replaced Israel as the people to be blessed. Unfortunately for them, that will prove to be wrong. So, in Daniel chapter 2, just to give you an overall picture, and we're going back to the image, Daniel 2, that Nebuchadnezzar saw in the times of the prophet Daniel, and which Daniel explained to him. So we read from the top there, In the days of those kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, nor shall the sovereignty of it be left 
to another people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. In other words, it won't disappear as kingdoms come and go. It will stay. And because you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, this is all part of the image, um, the, the Hebrew actually is not in hands. In other words, it's not a human power represented by the stone cut out of the mountain. It's not in hands. It's a divine power. It's Christ and his saints. Uh, the brass, the clay, the silver, the, sorry, the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, these represent the ancient empires the iron of Rome, the brass of the Greeks, the clay of Russia, the silver of Persia, and the gold of ancient Babylon. It says, The great God has made known to the king what shall happen hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation of it sure. Did we need that? Did we need that indication? Well, obviously in history they did. Today we have seen it fulfilled, almost. Not all, we we're there, ready for the final moves. And we can echo, yes, we know now. We've seen so much of it fulfilled. The dream is certain and the interpretation of it sure. So what about this? Just a few points about Russia. Putin, this is all taken from the press. Israel Chaim is the uh, most popular newspaper in Israel. Uh, and it, this was a headline. Putin needs quiet, not war, to achieve his goals in the Middle East. Yes, war is disturbing his gradual encroachment on the Middle East. He wants to keep it quiet so that his advance, as a peacekeeper actually, which is deceitful, as Daniel says, uh, so that he can get, Russia can get as far as he can. Uh, and Putin... The Bible says, Gog. Is Putin Gog? I can't answer that. But it certainly looks like now, but I'll come back to that. So the second one, Russia grabs the Middle East peace initiative from the US with a talks offer. Did you know that? That Russia has sidestepped the US and offered to the Palestinians and Hamas in the Gaza Strip, the terrorist organization in the Gaza Strip, uh, Russia has offered to them to chair and to supervise peace negotiations between the Palestinians and Israel. It's making its move. It doesn't want war. It wants to creep its influence in. Then it says on the third one there, why Russia wants Lebanon? Well, Lebanon is a gateway coming from the north into the Middle East and gives uh, Russia power over the Middle East. It is thought there is gas under the sea off Lebanon as there is off Israel and there is some question over where the maritime border is between Lebanon, which is immediately north of Israel, and Israel itself. And Russia wants to develop the gas reserves there off Lebanon. It will establish itself in the region. But Russia, as the fourth one says, Russia rising dawn over Libya. Or is it another Syria in the making? Is that going to be the result? As you know, Lib Libya is torn by civil war and strife. Russia is coming in. It's got a deep water port. It's got vast oil reserves. Why wouldn't Russia come in? There's a lot of advance. And it, it's a creeping movement. Then we have... Uh, here, the former head of the Vatican's highest court is renewing his urgent call to consecrate Russia by name to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. I don't know whether he asked Mary's agreement, whether she likes the idea of being uh, consecrated, consecrating Russia. But uh, well, we know she didn't agree because Mary, of course, is dead. She's waiting for the resurrection. But this is the idea, you see. The church is in it too. The church hates Israel because it is negating church teaching that the church is, has replaced Israel and the promises of God with regard to inheritance of the land of Jerusalem, they say belongs to the church. The Bible says Israel. And Israel being there is showing that the church's teaching 
is wrong. So we come to Russia and Turkey just escalated a war while you weren't watching. Now, I don't know whether you realize that. This is from the Washington Monthly. In Syria, there are Russians and Turkish forces. And they both want the same portion. Consequently, Russia has killed a significant number of Turkish troops. And it is becoming uh, head on. Erdogan of Turkey wants to be, head a caliphate, a Muslim caliphate in the Middle East. That would frustrate Russia's ambitions. So they're not friends, they're gradually opposing forces, which from Daniel chapter 11 verse 40 we expect to see because that's what mentions it. Then Gog and Magog. Gog, the name of the leader of Russia at Armageddon, and Magog, Central Europe, Germany. Uh, so that's there. So Magog and Magog, Russia warns Israel of war over Syria because uh, Israel has been bombing Iranian movements into Syria, bringing Iran closer to Israel with their boasting of destroying it. So uh, now Russia has got fed up with uh, Israeli attacks into Syria because Russia wants to be there. Magog is Germany. Well, that's the same story with Germany too. What is interesting, when you read the Israeli news, Israelis believe it's something that is going to happen. And actually the Israelis are talking about this from Ezekiel 38, just the same way as we do. They are actually believing that this will happen eventually. And then down the bottom, Putin joins Turkey, Iran. It's a bit of a conflict here, but you can see how it's developing. Because the ambition of Russia for, for a, uh, well over a century has been to occupy Turkey. And the British twice have been to war against Russia uh, to try and prevent Russia moving into Turkey. There was the Crimean War, well now Russia's got the Crimea. So they're saying that Israel is undermining regional stability. And um, is it? Or is it the other powers? Well here's Turkey's meddling, meddling threatens the Middle East peace. There is Erdogan, the leader of Turkey. As he says here, he has a vision of a new Islamic empire starting with Jerusalem. He wants to take over Jerusalem. Now that's a problem with Jordan because at the moment Jordan are responsible for the Temple Mount. But, uh, so there's all these tensions even between friends you might say. What Erdogan wants is a new Ottoman Empire, a new Turkish Empire in the Middle East. It's not going to happen. Now, I, I, some of these slides I've taken off um, from photographs of other people uh, in talks given, this one in the UK, but uh, what you've got at the top there, Russia promises to return the Palestines home. See Russian intrigue coming in against Israel on behalf of the Palestinians? And, and it says here, this is the headline, Russia promises Hamas to solve Palestinian problem. Well, of course, that's their intention. They will solve the Palestinian problem by destroying the Jews and the Palestinians. So, how Putin is winning in Syria? Russia's president skillfully couples hard with soft power. Hard is military power, soft power is economic and political power, and they're using both ways to win in the Middle East region. What about Europe? Well, this is the one that came out. Um, I've only got part of the name of the authority I've got that from, unfortunately. This part in blue there, which we haven't picked up. But the encirclement of Europe. This was another headquarters, it's a political uh, headline on the 19th of March this year. The bear, the Russian bear. Russia has extended its reach from the Baltic to the Mediterranean and projecting power to the Arctic and the Atlantic, also Africa, Turkey, Syria, Libya. Russia is reaching out everywhere 
for its, its own um, power dominating the world in the future. And of course with atomic weapons, nobody's game to have a take them on, are they? It'd be rather foolish. Now, Haaretz, which is uh, another Israeli newspaper, says, anyone pushing, this is with regard to the annexation of the West Bank, anyone pushing toward Israeli annexation in the West Bank will have to take into account the fact that beyond the pressures being exerted on Israel, which is from all around the world, such a step might lead to a struggle among the major powers. And this is the incredible thing here. Look. Between Russia and Europe on the one hand, that's Ezekiel 38. This is a political comment which is proving our understanding of Ezekiel 38. And the United States and Israel on the other. That's not exactly the warm, cosy spot that Israel would wish to be in. I would only put there Britain instead of the United, Nation, uh, United States. And then you've really got it. I'm not saying the United States won't be involved when Armageddon comes. It will. But the, the, the internal problems in the United States are such that Britain now is taking a leading role in the area and will continue to do so. Iran, Russia, China, Turkey celebrate the collapse of the US. And that's what we're seeing, the collapse of the power of the US. They're withdrawing back within themselves as a defense. So uh, it says that um, authoritarian regimes throughout the world are pushing narratives that appear to gloat over and celebrate that chaos unfolding in the United States. And that chaos, of course, though it says Black Lives Matter, has put over a thousand black people severely injured in hospital and killed quite a number of black people. It's got nothing with black to do with Black Lives Matter. They have become anti-Semitic. They're attacking Jewish businesses, Jewish synagogues. They're chanting death to Israel. As usual, the movement is taken over as anti-Semitic. What we've got here is Russia, China, Iran, increasingly Turkey, have all awaited the period when the world will become multipolar again. They have sought to work more closely together. The world is becoming um, this way. So, and down in Psalm 58, verse 6, you've, you've got the passage there. What about uh, Putin? He looks a bit worried here. Yes, he is worried. Because his... Um, his support in Russia is gradually being eroded all the time. And so they've introduced this vote in Russia, which took a, a, a week, a week ago, uh, to whether he could continue his rule until 2036. Well, he has claimed victory, but one would never know whether he did get the victory or not, because they were offering things like better flats, um, washing machines, and a, and a range of things to those who would vote for him, apparently. And uh, whether any vote in Russia can be said to be fair, I doubt. Anyway, he's now got his rule over Russia till 2036, which makes it really look as if Putin is Gog, the Gog of the Bible. The word Gog means the head or the chief, and he's undoubtedly the head and the chief of Russia. Now I'm leading here what I think is probably the most fascinating point so far and one of the most fascinating points I think in this talk for you this evening. This is where we come in with the pandemic, Colin. Um, the pandemic's geopolitical aftershocks are coming. Geopolitical. What's it, how's it going to affect the political stance of the countries of the world? And uh, these, um, this report says, but beyond the epidemiological challenges lies a slowly amassing threat that is not pathological in nature, but economic, political and military. You've got that? Economic, political, military, not medical. This is the geopolitical second wave 
and its power is already starting to concern Western leaders. This report continues. What might happen as a result of the pandemic on a geopolitical sense? World economic recession, fair enough, we see that's well on its way, leads to strategic shifts in power. It's going to change the balance of nations. You're seeing America reducing, backing out, and other powers becoming more prominent. Globalism reverses and the US retreats further. This idea of globalism has gone. It's every man for himself now. Russian geopolitical opportunism. Aha. Uh -huh. Why would it mention Russian opportunism? We'll see in a moment. Europe reforms, develops European army. That's coming, it's developing. Germany is training the, the armies of the different countries in Europe and actually installing their own officers in the, in the armies of the other countries in Europe and looks towards Russia. And Germany and now France is looking strategically towards Russia. France is pushing it very hard actually. The Catholic Church benefits in Europe. When you get something like this pandemic and these uncertainties, people start to look elsewhere for help. And they're turning, they will turn back to the church. The Bible is full of that. Um, Israel bucks the trend. Of course it does. Israel will have none of those moves. They're determined to stay and be independent. The United Kingdom international trade grows with the Middle East and the Commonwealth. And they've been negotiating trade agreements with Israel. The trade with Israel is growing very rapidly indeed. And uh, with leaving Europe, so the trade with the Com Commonwealth. Uh, Australia is really pushing a quick agreement with Britain. And so it goes on. Now, this is the third slide on this report, by, originally by a, a fellow by the name of Kaplan. And it, this is a report on his paper. Among Kaplan's concerns is how Russia and its leader, Vladimir Putin, will act. That's a fear. What's he going to do to restore his position when they've got COVID-19 in, um, in uh, Russia? The economy is collapsing and people are getting uh, fed up of the government. Something has to be done to maintain his position. Putin's aggressive opportunism will probably get worse. Notice that, because this is what the Bible says. The nature of Putin's leadership is that he can't stand still. He has to keep pushing forward, just as the Bible explains. It says he will push against him in Daniel 11 verse 40. He's pushing. Even the words are right. This makes him more volatile. What happens if the Russian leader, spooked by the country's collapsing economy, eyes an opportunity to test NATO's resolve? In what way will he uh, test NATO's resolve? Well, there's Europe for one thing. But it says the array of possible second wave consequences is dizzying. Now, to this report, I have put on the bottom something I picked up yesterday. This is brand new. Israel has oil deposits similar to Saudi Arabia, and that was reported to the Knesset. In the week just gone. It says about 250 billion, because nobody knows exactly yet, about 250 billion barrels of oil under Israel. They say this is, this is um, in shale oil, and it's, um, it's under, they say, about 15% of the Israel country. And the biggest deposits of oil are under the northern Negev, which comes under Israel. So, look, when it says in Ezekiel 38 that Russia will, and Europe will come to take a spoil and to take a prey, the spoil is there, and they're so anti-Semitic and so against Israel 
that there is the prey. Now, having said that, that's a political comment. Look at this from Elpis Israel, written by Dr. John Thomas, about the Bible in 1849. Politicians speculate as though money were omnipotent, and we hear financial reformers predicting the inactivity of Russia and Austria for want of funds. Well, that's fair enough. If they haven't got the funds, how can they go to war? Just a minute. Where did the barbarians procure funds for the overthrow of the Western Empire, that's the Roman Empire, in the 5th and 6th centuries? Did they not support themselves by the spoil? Do you know where the barbarians came from? Sorry? Scandinavia. Scandinavia, but also the Scythians, who were very significant here, came from the steppes of Russia. The Scythians and the Goths. And the Goths took over the Roman Empire for 70 years. It's interesting it comes from Russia and from the north there, you see. Okay, so it says, let the Russian treasury be as empty as it is said to be, and its expenditure exceed its revenue by double the alleged deficit. It will only operate as a pressure from within causing her autocrat to enter into the countries and to overflow and pass over, and to enrich himself with the spoil of those he is destined to subdue. That's virtually what we've just read on the last slide, which was a political comment. It's fascinating. 168, well actually, actually it's more than 168 years ago now, this is an older slide. The policy of the autocrat, the Russian ruler, and Putin is an autocrat now, will be to throw his adversaries off their guard and take the Sultan, the Turkish ruler, now it's heard again, by surprise. He is to come against him like a whirlwind. This is where this already indications of war coming. This is where it comes. He is to come against him, against Turkey, like a whirlwind, with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships, he will enter into the countries and overflow and pass over, and many countries shall be overthrown. This is the career marked out for him, which neither France, nor England, nor the world combined can obstruct or circumvent. And again, this is from the book, Elpis Israel. Interesting though, it says, with many ships. Russia has never been noted for its great navy, but it has today. I understand that the Russian Navy has a few more ships now than the American Navy. The American Navy is more powerful. But Russia is building as fast as they can go. Europe. The, uh, Revelation 12 verse 1 says, There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. It's actually talking about the, the, uh, the power of the church in Europe when you take it all in its context in the book of Revelation. But notice it says, upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Look at that picture. This is in the church in Europe. It's a symbol of the European community. The crown of twelve stars. And what you've got here... It's not horns, actually, it's a crescent moon. The idea there is of the church becoming a, uh, over, uh, supreme over Islam, represented by a crescent moon. And a wonder in heaven doesn't mean heaven above, it means simply, the in, in the figure, the governments of the world. So here it is, it's the church with power, imperial Power, that's what it's known through history, particularly in the time of the Holy Roman Empire. So here is uh, Barroso, this is going back a bit in 2007, but he's talking about the European Union. And he said, we are a very special construction, unique in the history of mankind. Well, that's true. Sometimes I like to compare the EU as a creation to the organisation of empire. It's a restoration of the Western Roman Empire. And he says, the first non-imperial empire. He knows what he's talking about because everybody, as historians, knows that the Holy Roman Empire was an imperial empire, imperial form of government. 
and uh, things are moving on. So what, what about their attitude? Well, we know how their attitude is hatred of Jews. The European Union's ongoing insistence on being anti-Semitic against all facts, they prefer to believe untruth, to encourage their anti-Semitism. For Europe, Israel is not a fulfilment of prophecy, it is little more than a Je Jewish refugee camp. This they say because they really think the church should establish itself and own Jerusalem and the Holy Land. As we said before, what is the doctrine called replacement theology is that the church will receive the blessings of the Bible, not the Jews, even though they're addressed to the Jews. But they say since they crucified Christ, the, the Jews no longer figure except in God's curses. Well, it's not true. So where does European aid to the Palestinians really go? They don't really care, like the leaders know, so long as they give them aid to oppose Israel. Well, here it is. How the European Union skirted the ban on funding terrorist groups. So they get around it. They give it to NGOs who they know are supporting the terrorists. But it doesn't matter. They can arm and uh, pr improve the, ter the terrorist activities against Israel because they hate Israel. So the European Union hypocrites take territory while blasting Israeli annexation. This is a new one. Um, Israelis, you know, are looking at annexing parts of the West Bank where they have their settlements. Interesting, they call them settlements. They're not settlements. They're cities. There's over half a million people there, Jews there. Um, but what that article, obviously I'm not bringing out the detail of that article, what it indicates takes France and it mentions the countries that, uh, and the islands that France has military, military taken over and is now claimed is uh, Rush, uh, French, French territory. It's okay for France to do it. It's okay for Germany to do it. Woe betide an Israelite that does it. But I like this little bit at the bottom. COVID-19 has put the European Union into intensive care. Well, the whole union is, is collapsing at the moment, economically. And this is driving them to separate from America and uh, more allied with Russia, as we expect. And the church is in it as well. Times of Israel, Russia, United Nations and Vatican condemn unilateral Israel annexation plan. But Israel hasn't annexed anything yet. Germany apparently has already produced the document condemning Israel before it's even done anything unilaterally, but they're ready to, to move with it. So the Vatican body asked the United Nations to end Israeli occupation. They want Israel out. They want to go in. United Nations Human Rights Council is a complete farce as it is led by China, Cuba, and Saudi Arabia. Well, that'd be all for human rights in their countries, wouldn't they? Um, Israel is the only country in the entire world that has its agenda item on the Human Rights Council. It's the only country, and it's the one they condemn every year for human rights, which has the best human rights record of any other nation on the Human Rights Council. What about the World Health Organization, which is another United Nations organization? You see, it, United Nations, unhealthy United Nations health. Um, the World Health Organization Annual General Assembly in Geneva always passes a resolution blaming Israel for Palestinian health problems. And yet Israel does so much to help them. I mean, they actually take people into Israel. They give them free operations, free heart operations and whatever. And even the families of the leaders of the terrorists have sent, then sent members of their families for free operations in Israel when they were needed. But somehow it's Israel that is condemned. 
Do you like this? That's Abbas, the leader of the Palestinian organization, an arch terrorist. This is the man that pays terrorist murderers or their families for their acts of murder against Israeli men, women and children. And the Pope calls Abbas angel of peace during Vatican meeting. The Pope, angel of peace. This is how mad the world is. Pope cautions against unfair Israeli-Palestinian peace plans. Anything Israel does is unfair in his eyes. The United Nations give human rights award to Palestinian terrorists. That's marvellous, isn't it? And they're there to establish peace and they award terrorism. Absurdity 101, I'm not quite sure why that comes out. Um, must be the number they've counted. UNESCO, the United Nations Education and Scientific Council, etc., helps Palestinian terrorists study human rights in Israeli prisons. What they have done, they've got murderers, terrorists, in Israeli prisons and they're using them to build up a, a um, human rights report on Israel, against Israel. They're using the prisoners, the murderers in prison, and they've actually have given them certificates of competence in human rights. And they've murdered women and children. Analysis. Iranian threat against Israel is only growing. Well, it is. They're constantly threatening to destroy Israel. And an Iranian commander says, we will annihilate our enemies, America, the UK, Israel, and our sword, Arabia. You feeling a bit nervous? Don't worry, God's in control. Then it's not going to end like this at all. That, 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 that's, not, that's not bad if Iran thinks they're going to get rid of America, the UK, Israel, and our sword. Wow. Of course, so much warfare now is also based on cyber war. And here you've got analysis, the cyber war between Israel and Iran. And the small lettering says, Israel has emerged as a cyber superpower with digital commandos capable of tracking and striking anywhere. Do you know how many explosions and fires have just occurred? How many? Just over a thousand in the last few weeks in Iran and their uh, nuclear facilities and um, army establishments have suddenly had explosions and fires. I doubt it's all caused by Israel. I think they're fairly incompetent as well. Um, analysis. Lebanon in dire straits because of Hezbollah. Hezbollah has brought Lebanon, which was the richest country in the Middle Eastern region. They brought them down to bankruptcy. Well, Iran wants to build an atomic bomb, but I think Australia, uh, Israel's frustrating that. But what we do read is Hezbollah is poised to attack Israel, leaving building tunnels under the Israeli border. And what we have to remember is we've got two brethren and a sister, Christadelphians in Lebanon. And they're in the middle of this. They're in great difficulty. State of Palestine, one dollar. Ah, so they're drafting a, a one dollar note. Fairly big, isn't it? Um, it's the delusion of Palestine and the reality of Israel. State of Palestine, they, they cannot get rid of Israel. It's there, it's God's will. Palestinians need to accept reality. Israel isn't going anywhere. And Jerusalem will always be its capital, period. That's from Israel today. And it's true. That's what the Bible says. Palestinians getting coronavirus aid from Israel respond with outrageous claims. Israel provided the Palestinians with tons of medical supplies. That's the uh, medication, that's um, masks, uh, the equipment to help them breathe when they've got coronavirus and so on and, and also the tests for it and they trained 
the medical people in the Palestinian Authority to actually use it all. And instead of that, they've complained to the United Nations that Israel refused to allow them any help and they're deliberately spreading COVID-19 amongst the Palestinians. It's a very honest world we live in. Um, but as for Israel being there, of course, Brother John Thomas in his book, Help Us Israel, there is then a partial and primary restoration of Jews before the manifestation, the second advent of Christ. The pre adventual before Christ comes. Colonization of Palestine will be on purely political principles and the Jewish colonists will return in unbelief of the Messiahship of Jesus and of the truth as it is in him. And so it is. It's true. Here's Netanyahu, the uh, Prime Minister of Israel, and what he is saying here, that um, Israel cares more about Palestinians than their own leaders do. That is true. They give so much help to them, and the leaders are trying to keep the people in absolute destitute, because they're putting all their money into their own bank accounts, um, and, um, and into armaments against Israel. No, this is from Isaiah, Isaiah 57. Peace, peace. But there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Right at the end of Isaiah 57. And, and what the small letters say there is, most of the problems in the world today could be avoided by raising our children right. Absolutely so. And that doesn't only apply with the Arabs, where they're teaching their children at school to kill and to grow up as terrorists, but it's right in every country of the world. As the, uh, the, there's no morality left, it would seem, in the world. Do the Palestinians deserve a state? Everybody's pressing for it. But they have rejected the state several times. They're not interested in a state as such. What they're interested in is killing every last Jew in the Holy Land. There are Palestinians who realize they're much better off with the Jews, with Israel. But the report now is that Palestinians are being tortured for saying they'd rather be Israeli. So is this really the kind of Palestinian state the world wants to, to bring into existence? A state of torture and tyranny. Of course, the, the, um, the Palestinians do want peace. This is it. And for peace to happen, the war must end. That's what Israel says. We know that. That comes from Psalm 83. Psalm 83 shows the Palestinians and the countries contiguous with Israel invading Israel with the idea of destroying them, cutting off their name and occupying all their houses. But the Bible says Israel will win. Now they're pushing annexation this is in the Jordan Valley, before the US election. And though there are Arabs who oppose the idea of annexation in the Jordan Valley and in the West Bank, in actual fact, what you find out behind the, what they publicly say, that in favor of it, especially Jordan. If Israel annexes the Jordan Valley, they've already got um, farms and that there and troops, it provides for the um, security of Jordan, and they know it. So in that case, the Arab states quietly back Israeli annexation. I was only reading today that the, that the, um, the Arabs who are employed by the settlements in the West Bank, the Jewish settlements, earn three times the wages that you get as if you were employed by the Arab there. And, um, well, they would be unemployed actually without it. And they get all the benefits as well. So, Jordan said they would, you know, take severe views. But actually, they know it's necessary for their own security. So we've got why Jordan will not oppose Israeli annexation. 
So Psalm 83, Israel will only attain peace through victory. It's coming, it's coming. That's not Armageddon, that's prior to Armageddon. But the IDF chief, the number of Israel's enemies is greater than the number of fronts. That's their problem, how to fight a war on several fronts at once. Now I'm going to leave all that and bring to a conclusion, but I just had to put this one in. This is nobody I know on the screen. Uh, and it all comes from one pinky bone. Apparently that the, the Israelis have found a, a pinky bone, one of these, and nothing associated with it. And from it, they have devised a whole semi-human being, a missing link in, evolu uh, in uh, human evolution, just from one pinky bone. Romans in chapter 1 verse 23, 24 says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness. And evolution has not helped the world. It's brought about the problems in the world we see today. Because no longer is anybody answerable to a greater power. And when you come to evolution, there isn't one idea of evolution. There's dozens of different approaches. And the scientists argue amongst themselves. Very strenuously. Science is uncertain. What we've got here is the Bible is certain. It stood the test of time. The way its prophecies have been fulfilled not only indicate to us we're at the time of the end and there's little time left, we don't know how long, but it also indicates the Bible is reliable. It's certain. We needn't doubt it. The purpose of prayer. Because I'm sure when you look at what's going on in the world, we're driven to prayer, aren't we? What do we pray for? Now I find this interesting. The purpose of prayer is not to get us out of trouble. The purpose of prayer, the purpose of trouble is to get us into prayer. So what is going on in the world at the moment leads us to prayer, doesn't it? To pray for peace, to pray for a better day when Christ is here. Look at the world we're living in. This is taken from the Justice Department roof at, at uh, what's going on in this world. That's the real world we live in. This is what's coming. And we pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you.